Abraham, your wife Sarah, Sarai is going to be Sarah, and promised to make of him a great nation. Then the Lord gave a requirement to Abraham. And the Lord said, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout the generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And the uncircumcised male child, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So God made a covenant of what he would do for Abraham. And God made one little request in return from Abraham. That Abraham would cause his male sons and, and the descendants after them that they would be circumcised is a sign that they were in covenant relationship with God. And so from the beginning of God's promises to Abraham, circumcision was the sign that a person was in covenant relationship to God. And we can read in Ezekiel 44 verse 9, Thus says the Lord God, No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. Foreigners couldn't go into the sanctuary of God if they were uncircumcised. But the Lord did say, from right when Israel was leaving Egypt in Exodus 12, He said that when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover of the Lord, when someone who wasn't a Jew wanted to convert, and, and uh, worship the Lord and partake of the Passover for us, Christ our Passover, sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5. But they would, if they wanted to keep the Passover, let all his males be circumcised. Then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land. The foreigner who is circumcised shall become a Jew shall be as the native of the land, can take the Passover of the lamb. But no uncircumcised person shall eat it. So that was the defining mark of God's people for all of the males to be circumcised. And we also learn how God severely warned Moses about the importance of circumcision when he was going down to Egypt. In Exodus 3, we read the scripture yesterday, the Lord appeared to Moses at the burning bush and called him to be a deliverer. But then in the next chapter when he was going down to Egypt, called of God to be the deliverer, given miracles and power, we get a very strange story. It says there, it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. Ay ay ay. That doesn't sound very friendly. The Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. But the rest of the story, then Zipporah, his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So God let Moses go. His wife rescued him. That's what wives do sometimes, right? <laughs> okay. And so here we find that God, sending the deliverer down to Egypt on the way, said, oh, Sandalila, my problema, we've got to take care of something first. And maybe Moses wasn't listening very well. God got his attention when the Lord sought to kill him. Now, how would you like it if, if you did something displeasing the Lord and he seeks to kill you? Ay, 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 okay. God was saying something was very, very serious. And the serious problem was Moses was going down to deliver the children of Abraham from slavery, to bring them up to their covenant land, the covenant people of God, who were all supposed to be circumcised, and Moses had not circumcised his own son. He's going to be a deliverer of the circumcised, when he isn't practicing what he preaches, when it isn't even working in his own family. And so the Lord, to show him the importance, sought to kill him. We don't know how, probably 
you know, some sudden sickness or something. But you know, if God really wanted to kill Moses, how long would it take God? Right? <laughs> You're gone, right? Angel of the Lord once in Hezekiah's day killed 185 uh, uh, chosen Assyrian captains and leaders of the army in one night. Well, if an angel could do that, how long would it take God to kill one person? But they recognized, and his wife had the opportunity to circumcise the son, so God let Moses go. Exodus 4, verse 24 to 26. Now, God obviously could have killed Moses if that's what he really wanted. Jonah could have died in the belly of the great fish if that's really what God wanted. Okay, But, no, God was emphasizing capital, bold, underlined. This is important. Circumcision, the sign you are in covenant relationship to God. And so, how could he lead the Israelites out of Egypt when he didn't practice it in his own family? Because first of all, it was the sign given at the promise of making the great nation. The sign of God's covenant people. And Moses, to deliver them, had to have that in his own family. And number two, as I mentioned, we have to make sure that we practice what we preach. Now, we also see later on in the next generation, the first thing that God commanded Joshua when they crossed the Jordan River was that they were to have all the Israelite men be circumcised. And so we can read in Joshua 5, verse 2 and 89, At that time, after they crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So it was when they were finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were all healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. And Gilgal from the Hebrew means rolling or rolled away. God was rolling away the sin, the reproach of Egypt. They weren't Egyptians. They weren't to live like Egyptians. No. They were in covenant relationship with God, the sons of Abraham. They weren't. They had been in Egypt, but they weren't to stay in Egypt in their hearts and lives. And so at Gilgal, after they crossed Jordan, then they, at Gilgal, all the generation, it says in another scripture, that had been born in the wilderness had not been circumcised. So at the Jordan River, it was time. Now Joshua and the Israelites continued to camp at Gilgal for seven years until they had finished conquering the promised land. You study the book of Joshua, chapter 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, that seven times in the seven years that Joshua and his army were conquering the promised land, it mentions that the Israelites were still living in their camp at Gilgal. At Gilgal, the place of circumcision, at the place of, of cleansing, at the place of having the sin, the reproach of Egypt taken away, at the place where they the, where rose up as true sons of Abraham, sons of God, there... As they lived in Gilgal, they went out to conquer. They went out to conquer. They went out to conquer the promised land. And if we want to conquer and obtain all the promises of God for our lives, we need to spiritually live at Gilgal, the place of circumcision, of having consecrated hearts, and stay there. However long it takes, however many, until how many years until we have conquered all. Joshua and the army camped at Gilgal. Now from the very beginning, the Jews recognized that circumcision was not just a physical surgery for the male babies, but it had spiritual meaning. And so Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 30, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. 
That was the purpose of circumcision. Not just in the flesh as an outward sign, yes, but it was that our hearts would be circumcised so that we would be able to love God freely and have all of the things of the flesh cut away, the reproach of Egypt rolled away, and we can shine forth in the kingdom of our Father as His children, the sons of God. Now, we also can read that the cutting away of the flesh in the surgery of circumcision signifies that we need to have our fleshly desires and lusts cut away or removed out of our lives. Moses again said in Deuteronomy 10, Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Don't be disobedient. Don't be stubborn. Get your heart circumcised and you'll love the Lord and you'll serve Him with a joyful heart not kicking and fighting as he drags us along like Jonah, right? No, but he can change us and give us circumcised hearts. And then we also read in Colossians 2 in the New Testament that we are to put off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So here we read Jesus has a circumcision for us. It's not just Moses. It's not just in the Old Testament. Christ has a circumcision for us. And what is it? It's not to cut off a piece of flesh from the little babies. No, it is to remove from us the sins of the flesh. That is the circumcision Christ wants to give His people. Okay, so there was an outward sign, but it signified an inner change of heart and not just a heart for the Israelites for God's Old Testament people it's for the Christians to have the circumcision of Christ the cutting away of the sins of the flesh that we also can love the Lord our God with all of our hearts all of our souls everything within us cry out Lord I love you and I love your ways Lead me on, Lord. Not like Jonah. <laughs> right? right? Okay. Now, in the Old Covenant, when the Israelites crossed the Jordan River, right after that they were circumcised. So we have the picture crossing the Jordan, and right on the other side they camped, made a camp, and they named the place Gilgal, the place of the rolling away, the cutting away of the flesh signifying a change of heart and it's being it's crossing the Jordan that brings us into circumcision of heart now we don't have time to study it in one session very well but uh, crossing the Jordan signifies being crucified with Christ the ark was brought into the middle of the Jordan and then the waters were cut off far upstream at a place named Adam and the waters of death that went down the Jordan to the Dead Sea were cut off at Adam when the ark went into the river. The ark is a symbol of Jesus Christ, if you've had your typology class in Bible school. If not, uh, applications are open for next year, okay? Uh, but as they went into, as the priests carried the ark of the covenant into the Jordan, it was signifying Christ himself stepping into the Jordan to cut off the waters of death that flowed up from Adam, from our first forefather, Adam. He sinned and death and sin passed from him down to all his descendants. Now, Jesus stood at the Jordan River centuries later, and there was declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The one who stepped into the Jordan for us. He who knew no sin. Who became sin for us. To cut off our sin flowing down from Adam. So that we can be free to step into the promised land. Into the promises and blessings and grace of God. And find 
that we experience a Gilgal, a circumcision of heart, that when we embrace the cross in our life and move on, it will be with a circumcision. For us, a circumcision of heart. But that happened. They crossed the Jordan and then they entered into circumcision. And there are so many different ways God could circumcise our hearts today. As different as the sands on the sea are the different ways God can try to work in our hearts. But let me just give you a couple of examples so, so you'll get a little glimpse of this. When I was in Bible school, I uh, was touched by God at a, at a chapel service. And so instead of going to lunch, I went into the prayer room alone. And uh, with the burden of the Spirit of God on me, I was weeping before the Lord. And, and then God showed me a vision. And in the vision, I saw my heart with sin or, or a, a crust, a hardness on the outside of my heart. But God spoke a word to me that was like a sword that cut my heart, that circumcised, cut something off my heart. And the sword that he spoke was, lay not up for yourself treasures on earth where a moth can corrupt and thieves can steal. And what happened was, uh, I had been a rock and roll musician before I got saved. And before I went to Bible school, I, I sold my super big amplifier and had a fair amount of money in the bank. And that first year at Bible school, I felt pretty good with my bank account. I'd never had so much money, you know, just sitting there in all my a few short years, okay, 20 years old. Oh, you know, that's pretty good to have a bank account like that. And, and then the word of the Lord, lay not up for yourself treasures on earth. Oh, and I saw the wrong love that I had in my heart towards money, the money that I had in the bank. It pierced my heart. The word of God was sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing between soul and spirit, exposing the wrong affection, the wrong covetousness, the wrong idolatry in my heart. And when I saw that by the circumcision of the sword of the spirit, I cried out, Oh God, tomorrow morning as soon as the bank opens, I'll go to the bank, I'll take out all my money, and the first missionary I find, I'll give it to him. And then the Lord spoke again, and he said to me, I didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> okay. And then he spoke again, and he said, From now on, all of the money that I entrust to you, you are the steward, and it is mine. God circumcised my heart so that I would not love money, so that I would not cling to it. And that was an important preparation because since then there has been a lot of money that have flowed through these hands. And, and Pastor Bailey always gave a, the uh, imagery. He said, we always want to have Teflon hands. We all know Teflon, you know, no stick pans. We want to have Teflon hands that if money is given us, it can flow out as easy as it flows in. Now there are times God wants us to save money. Okay, there are times he wants us to do different things. It, it, it's not a sin to have money. But we need circumcised hearts because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, a great danger. And so God circumcised my heart at that time. A few short years later, I had graduated from Bible school. I was out in the ministry and... Uh, I was getting promotions and offers to do this and that. And uh, I was offered that I could start a radio program on the city of Detroit's biggest rock and roll station. Unsaved music on the whole channel. Except the owner had just gotten saved. And so he was going to let me have an hour slot every day to put in Christian music. Okay, and I could, you know preach a little, slip in the gospel between the songs. And, wow, what an opportunity. About an average one million people listen to that at any given time in the day. And that's great. And uh, I had been a rock and roll musician before I got saved. My goal in life was to be uh, a rock star and, you know, make my own albums. When I was 15 years old, I um, wrote some songs and 
made a record, got, got played on the radio when I was 18. I was playing before uh, solo uh, performances for up to 8,000 people. And when I got saved, oh, I'm going to rock and roll for Jesus. Hallelujah. Okay. Well, God had a little bit of circumcision to do. And after I graduated from Bible school, I had already uh, written uh, more than a dozen good Christian songs, good for that stage of my spiritual development. And somebody offered that they would pay all the expenses for me to record them in a recording studio. And recording studios cost a lot of money to make an album with about 12 songs in it back then. It paid all free. And I was just ready to step up and, you know, I'm on my way to Christian stardom. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. Okay. And then the Lord spoke. And the sword of the Spirit came and said, It is not my will that you become a Christian recording artist. You become a professional musician and singer. I have something else for your life. But for all my teenage years, the only thing I wanted was to record albums, become a professional, and, and that was my goal. That was my idol. Okay? And then the word of the Lord, the sword of the Spirit, cuts and oh, how painful it was to let that begin to die and to die. And God told me, resign from the ministry. Don't take the big uh, radio station off or don't record an album. God had something else for me. And he led me into a season of seeking God after having temporarily resigned from the ministry. God was circumcising my heart as a relatively young Christian. Now, let's read in Romans 2, 28 through 29, what the Apostle Paul said. In the Old Testament, every male Jew had to be circumcised to be one of God's people. But similarly, in the New Testament, every Christian needs to be spiritually circumcised. Paul wrote in Romans 2, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, or a circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he who is a true Jew is one inwardly, whose circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, the letter of the law, but in the spirit, whose praise is not from men, but whose praise is from God. And then again in Colossians 2.11, we are to put off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It's not just an Old Testament concept. It's for us. It was crucial for the Old Testament believers that if they weren't circumcised, they were cut off from the people of God. And for us, we need the circumcision of Christ. We need an inward circumcision to be a true spiritual Jew, a true son of Abraham as a Christian. Okay? Now, does our carnal Adamic sinful nature like to have the sins of the flesh cut away? Well, no way. What about a little baby that's circumcised? <laughs> right? And what happens when God puts the knife or the sword of the Spirit to the fleshly things in our life? How do we often react? Rah! Bloody murder! Ah, God's trying to kill me! Now, maybe He is trying to kill you, okay? <laughs> but He's only trying to kill the old sinful Adamic nature so that the new resurrection, beautiful life of Christ may arise to shine and permeate our lives and shine forth. But there are times God points out sins in our life. And he says, you got to change that. you got to deal with that. you got to cut that out of your life. Stop that wrong relationship. It's going to turn you in a wrong direction. If you eat that junk food and you're defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit. You stop that. Okay. <laughs> You watch that gay TV comedian? He's polluting your spirit. Turn the TV off. Okay? The Holy Spirit can... He's very creative. He can speak any way he wants. Okay? 
And he knows what our heart needs to become circumcised, to become more and more holy, putting off the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And that is not an option for the Christian. It is a requirement for the Christian. Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, this one can be tough. He said, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That was Jesus' command. Be perfect. And we'll study that more so you can understand that better. But circumcision of the heart is to work these things into our life. That we will fully love the Lord our God. So that we will become holy. So that we will become more and more perfect. And circumcision of the heart brings us from the foundation of imputed righteousness into our receiving imparted righteousness. We'll study this a little. So if you're confused, what's imputed, what's imparted, relax, okay? We'll, we'll spend a little time here, okay? So... The work of the cross, that's imputed righteousness. God imputes the righteousness of Christ to us who are sinners. Okay? To impute something means to legally give something to someone that you have. Okay? I break the law and my wife is imputed as a guilty associate in the crime. Okay? Uh, that's something that's imputed. Uh, a son does something fabulous, and it's attributed or imputed to the upbringing he has received from his parents or her parents. Okay, it's something legally given to us by the work of another, imputed righteousness. But the work of the cross for us is to come into our heart and be the work of the cross in us and the work of the cross in us brings circumcision of heart when they crossed the Jordan were crucified with Christ then they went to Gilgal they were circumcised of heart and so when we embrace the cross for us Jesus died for our sin then the work of the cross in us is that therefore we have died with Christ and been buried with him, that we will walk in newness of life. Imputed righteousness into imparted righteousness. Until, step by step, we grow in God, we have more and more of a circumcised heart, we embrace the cross more and more, until at final full maturity we can declare triumphantly like the Apostle Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ shining out of our lives, unhindered by worldly things, corruption, by an uncircumcised heart. No. Christ for us, and then Christ innocent through us. He desires to accomplish his whole work. So we have a chart now on the overhead, and you'll get it in your paper, so you don't need to write furious, relax, just enjoy and, 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 and listen, okay? But let's look first at righteousness in the top uh, row of the chart. Righteousness first is imputed to us, and then it wants to go on to become imparted into us. And that is, first, Christ's work to be imputed is Christ's work for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us. What? So that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ. He took our sins so that we can be given His righteousness. He was the Lamb that took our sins so we 
can take his pure sacrifice and sin is dealt with and put away. So that is Christ's work for us to give us righteousness by his work on the cross. But then it is to work deeper and deeper into us so that it's not just Christ's cross forgiving our sins legally on the outside, we could say, but know the work of God within us, the cross within us, doing his work until we are crucified with Christ. We've crossed our Jordan. We've come to Gilgal. We are circumcised in our heart to fully love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and strength. And the reproach of Egypt, the sin of this world, is rolled away. We will walk in newness of life. Now, a description of this work is that imputed righteousness is a legal gift. The gift of Christ. We are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift, not of our works. Now, righteousness imparted into us is not just a legal gift given to us, but it is something that is in worked into us until it is functioning in our life and experience. That is not a righteousness Christ gave us somewhere distant on the cross, but is a righteousness that now is living full bloom in our life. Not just for us, but now in us and through us, imparted righteousness. And the source of imputed righteousness is the cross of Jesus Christ. When he died as the Lamb of God on Calvary about 2,000 years ago. But the source of imparted righteousness is when we carry our own cross. When we carry our own cross daily, we become more and more crucified with Christ. And what is God's, what did Jesus say? Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you would follow me, take up your cross daily and follow after me. So the cross was a gift of salvation to us when Christ hung on the cross, but that work is now to become experiential in us. Saving grace is to also become sanctifying grace, where the cross of Christ in our life transforms us and we are circumcised of heart. And when we're first born again, we receive Christ as our Savior, the external uh, testimony of our being saved is that a new Christian should be water baptized. You can be a Hindu or a Catholic and uh, a young person could say to their parents, uh, Mom and Dad, I asked Jesus into my heart. And the Hindu parents would say, Oh, oh, that's nice, son. Yes, okay. Yes, we can add Jesus to the 30 gods on our idol, on our altar, okay? Well, Jesus, he's okay. You know, we'll add him to all the rest. No problem. Or the Catholic, oh, you asked Jesus in your heart? Oh, that's good. I asked Jesus in my heart uh, every Easter and Christmas. It's, that's good. Okay. But if you're water baptized, what? You've turned from the faith? You're water baptized? You're saying you're one of those crazy Christians? Don't you know you've disowned all of our Hindu gods? Don't you know Mother Mary is pleading for your soul? <laughs> right. Okay. Water baptism. A testimony. We have been buried with Christ. We receive the cross and salvation of Jesus. But the way that we can tell if the grace of God, the righteousness of Christ, has become imparted into us is when we develop a sanctified life, then people don't just see from a water baptism or a, you know, a certificate, I was water baptized on August 1st, 2000. No, but they see from our life. You're different. You're, you're becoming more and more like Jesus. You, you're really a Christian, aren't you? 
Yes. Shown by the work of Christ in us. The cross in us. Developing a sanctified life. And with our next slide. Again, righteousness that is imputed is by faith imputed to us without works. We all know Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9. We're saved by grace through faith, not of our works, lest any man should boast. It's not our works. It's the free gift of God in Christ. Imputed righteousness is given us without works. However, when God starts to impart His righteousness into us, then that is shown and declared and revealed by our works. James 2.18 said, You say you have faith with no works? I will show you by my works that I have faith. Baldictat, okay? So there's the two sides of redeeming grace. There's the side without works that imputes the salvation of Jesus to our needy soul. But then as the Holy Spirit comes into us, we're born again, the grace of God starts to work in us. The cross of Christ is leading us into a crucified, sanctified, circumcised heart. Then we find that our works will show we have imparted righteousness. Oh, that young man, he is becoming a godly Christian. Why? Imputed grace is becoming imparted grace, working within us. We do not deny or frustrate the grace of God, but we allow us, ourselves to be crucified with Christ. And then... There's the thought we mentioned before from Matthew 5, 48, where Jesus said, Be perfect, as my Father in heaven is perfect. There is a perfection that is progressive, and then that comes to mature, full perfection. And we could liken this, that there can be progressing maturity in someone's life where when they're first born, they're a cute little baby and everyone says, you know, how many fingers? Five each. How many toes? Five each, you know. Okay, yeah, uh, uh, they're a perfect baby. <laughs> oh, change the diaper. Oh, he's a perfect baby. Okay, the, the digestive system works fine too. Change the diaper. Okay, perfect baby. Okay, a perfect baby has no responsibilities. It just eats, sleeps, or it doesn't even eat it. It just drinks, sleep, drink, sleep, drink, sleep. A pretty, pretty easy life, right? But after a few months, things start to change. The parents start to train them. And after six months, no, 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 don't bite. No, no, no. You know, to learn to walk or to crawl first, okay. And, and then they have to start to grow up. And a perfect baby needs their diaper changed. They can't walk. You know, they can't do much of anything. But they're perfect. But what happens if the person is 20 years old and you still have to change their diaper okay and all they can do is watch the cartoons on tv <laughs> go, 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 go. as they're 20 years old and they haven't grown and developed my problema right and so god wants to train us from a babyhood perfection we're saved by grace. We become babies in Christ, born again. But then we grow in grace. The Apostle Peter wrote, we grow in grace until we can come to a perfect man, to the fullness of the stature of Christ. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.13. That is a mature perfection. Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child. That's all that's expected of a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
And when we're young Christians, we'll talk like baby Christians. We'll act like baby Christians. We'll have problems. Sometimes that your spiritual mom or dad will have to change your diaper and, and, you know, help you out in your problems. But as we start to grow up, we are to put away childish things. We are to grow in grace. From imputed grace into imparted grace. Maturing as Christians. Okay? Until from the babies, we know the second stage of 1 John 2, where John wrote, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one, grown up into strength, discipline, growing maturity. Now, another example is that a young boy can be called a perfect scholar with very limited knowledge. If you're only five or six years old, you'll struggle with two times six, 12? And fabulous! Right! You get a star on your paper, okay? But what happens if you're a university student and you're going, two times six? I'm not sure. Is it 12? You know? Is that a perfect scholar for a university? No, not at all. So we need to understand there is the maturing, developing perfection. And in a similar way, our spiritual life needs to be a progression of growth. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, we looked at yesterday, we all are changed into the same image of Christ from glory to glory. Progressive transformation. 1 Samuel 2.8 or our Second Peter 3, we're to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. If somebody never reads their Bible, and, you know, they're 20 years old Christian, and somebody says, uh, can you explain to me uh, John 3.16? Say, uh, John 3.16, uh, is that God is love? You know? Uh, no. Grow in knowledge. You're no longer... A maturing, perfect Christian unless we grow. And then again, we saw yesterday for Samuel 2.8. He raises the poor out of the dust and out of the dunghill to prepare us to be among the princes, inheriting a throne of glory. Now, if you have a Bible, please turn in your Bible now to Philippians chapter 3. We want to spend a little bit of time in this chapter to really understand how the Apostle Paul taught what we are now trying to show you. Progressive perfection. You can be a perfect baby, but then you need to grow up into becoming a perfect man in the full stature of Jesus Christ, as Paul had written in Ephesians 4. Now, are we all in Philippians chapter 3? Okay, let's start in verse 12. Paul said, Not that I have already attained... Nor am I already perfected. Your translation might say mature or completed. But the word perfected there is uh, tilio. And it comes from the Greek word that Jesus used, be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. But this is not that exact word. It's an uh, it's, uh, adjusted form of it. And this perfection means... Tilio here means a mature, complete perfection. And so Paul was saying, when he wrote the Philippians, he'd already been a successful apostle for many years, started many churches. He said, I have not yet come to this complete, mature perfection. Is what he was saying. That he said, but, what does he do? I press on. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended or come to this full perfection, this full maturity. But verse 13, one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to the things that are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what he said we need to do. We're not perfect in full maturity, 
You can be perfect as a baby, perfect as a spiritual 10-year-old, as a young man, but to go on, we need to leave behind things of the past, sins, bondages, pride, whatever we need to leave that's holding us back and wholeheartedly run after the upward call of God, that God is calling us higher and higher to be more and more like Him, to have strength upon strength, to go from glory to glory, to grow in grace, from one level of grace to higher levels of grace. And then, let's look in verse 15, what Paul wrote. He said, if we're leaving behind the things of the past and wholeheartedly pressing on, he said, therefore let us, as many as our perfect, or maybe your translation says mature, but that word is perfect. It is teleos. It's the exact same word Jesus used in Matthew 5 when he said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus said, be perfect, be teleos. And Paul said, as many of us as our telios, telios, as our perfect, will have this mind. What is the mind? That we leave behind the failures, the weaknesses, the things of the past. We wholeheartedly press on for the higher, greater things of God. And if we have that wholehearted pressing on, then he said, you are perfect. The same word Jesus used, be perfect. Telios. Now some translations say fully mature, but it's the same word. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So if we want to be perfect, what does our mind have to be? We have not yet come to full, complete perfection we have not yet finished our fight, finished our race, accomplished all of God's purposes, had our 100-fold fruitfulness. No, unless you're ready to cross the finish line into heaven, we've still got something more to do for the kingdom of God. We've still got more growth to seek for, to grow in grace daily, carry our cross daily, go on in God and be more fruitful. But if in our mind we are leaving behind the things of the past and pressing on to the higher, greater things of God, then you can be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. A maturing perfection in our lives. And then let's read in verse 15 again. As many as are perfect have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even that to you. So what happens if we're pressing on in God, and God shows us, oh, you've got a problem, or you've got to stop that, or there's a higher standard for you. Others are permitted by God to do that. You cannot. What happens when God reveals something afresh to us? Then... Either we harden our heart. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. But sometimes when the sword of the Spirit comes, we harden our heart. We say, Lord, I've, I've you know, carried my cross enough. I've had enough difficulties. I'm going to relax. I'm going to enjoy a little bit of the good life. You know, This is only a little sin, Lord. Just a little sin, please. Can I keep this? Okay. No. If God speaks, then what do we do? We have to let it get cut off by the circumcision of Christ. Cut off the sins of the flesh. Leave it behind in the past and press on to the new higher call, the new greater consecration, to the new greater victory that God wants to bring us into. So do we understand that? In verse 12, Paul said, I am not yet fully mature in, in maturity and in completion of my calling and fruitfulness. No, but what I do, leave behind the past. I'm pressing on for the upward call of God. And any of us that do that are perfect. 
And if there's anything in our life that doesn't measure up, God will show us. And then we have to take a step higher. And then when we obey that, we're perfect. And then if God reveals something else to us that He's dealing with that we need to change in our life as we let the work of the cross as that circumcised out, He'll take us to a higher level of righteousness, of holiness, of victory, of purity, of heart. So do we understand this? This is crucial for our lives because there is an unbalanced and dangerous doctrine being spread especially in the last few years here in Asia throughout the body of Christ, that it's okay for Christians to just sin and sin and sin and sin. No problem. God's grace forgives our past, present, and future. It's all great. So, you know, you want to, you know, continue to steal and, you know, have pornography. and It's, it's no problem. God's grace covers all. There are differences for different Christians. Others may, you may not. A baby Christian gets his diaper changed. A 20-year-old should know how to control himself and not need diapers changed. We need to grow as Christians. Grow in holiness. We are born again. We're to be water baptized. We're to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We need to go on into circumcision of heart. We need to uh, enter into the promised land conquer our enemies, obtain our full inheritance in Christ, get all of the promises of God He offers our life, and then we'll be ready to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my race. Now there is a crown waiting for me in heaven. As Paul said at the end of his life. But there are many that don't rightly divide the word of truth. Yes, God gives us imputed grace. That without works, we are sinless before God. That's true. That's part of the work of God. Christ for us. But Paul said we need to learn how to rightly divide the Word of God. The Word of God is often two-edged. God does this. Man needs to do that. Go and preach the Gospel. Stay in Jerusalem. Many times, the Word of God is two-edged. Yes, no. And we, by the Spirit of God, by the wisdom of God, must rightly divide the Word of truth and know what is balanced, healthy doctrine. Because there are many preaching unbalanced, dangerous doctrine. You can sin. You can do whatever you want. God forgives. And they end up becoming more and more corrupt. Now Paul, when he said, shall we sin because we're not under law, we're under grace? He said, certainly not! No! But there are preachers today that are saying, we're not under the law, we're not under bondage to rituals, we're under grace, you can sin. But the Word of God says, no, certainly not. Jude said, there are many deceivers that have crept into the body of Christ that teach that grace is a license to continue to sin. That God permits it. God will bless it. And yes, God tolerates when, you know, he's got to change the diapers on the three-month-old. That's no problem. But not for the mature Christian. God wants us to grow in grace, grow in holiness, be perfect at our level, and then if God shows us something else, go on in God to a higher level. God exposes another thing in our life to be changed. Deal with it. Get circumcised. Go on and on from glory to glory, from strength to strength, until we will see Jesus face to face. Now, in the time of Christ, many Jews were deceived that they were God's children because they were physically circumcised. So you can read the whole story in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, where the Jews were saying to Jesus, we're Abraham's children. We're not under bondage to sin. You know, we're, 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 we're God's children. God is our Father. But Jesus said, 
if, if he said, Abraham is not your father. You are of your father, the devil, because you do the works of the devil. So Jesus didn't say, the outward circumcision, just following the ritual, means that you're okay with God. You just, you know, quote a scripture and do a little religious thing and, you know, you're headed for heaven. No, Jesus said, it's obvious you're not headed for heaven. You're not God's children because you do the works of the devil. Satan is your father. And the Jews didn't like hearing that. They trusted in their ritualistic religion as being enough. But there are still Christians today that are deceived and think that if they're religious, if they have a form of godliness, if, you know, well, I was born again 15 years ago, and, you know, I'm an alcoholic now, and, you know, I have this problem, that, but, but I know Jesus saved me, you know. Okay. Would Jesus say, Oh, you're ready for heaven? Or would he say, you're in danger of hell? Jesus warned that there will be many who should, who think they should enter heaven that will not be allowed in. Christ said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons and do many wonders in your name? And I will say to them, depart from me, you who practice sin. They had known the Lord in past years. They had prophesied and known the anointing, but they slipped into a life of disobedience and sin. And in the last day, if they keep in that sin, Jesus will say, I never knew you. You are not welcome to heaven. So we need to understand the seriousness of this. For our life, yes, but especially for those that we teach, that we rightly divide the word of truth. That yes, God loves everyone and His grace will forgive any sin. Christ died for sinners. That He who knew no sin has given us His righteousness as the Lamb of God. It's wonderful. It's glorious. But there's the other side of the balance too. If we don't carry our cross daily, we are not His disciple. That Jesus wants us to grow and go on from being little babies into becoming young men and women that start to gain victory over sin and Satan. Now, different people are at different levels. Different people have different capacity. I mentioned to you yesterday that uh, our, my wife and I, uh, our eldest daughter, Rebecca, she was a straight A student from day one. Our younger daughter, she did good to get D's, to just barely pass. And we would praise her for a D, and our own older daughter, what do you mean? You, you know, you're mad if I get a B, and you praise her D's? Because she had a learning disability. That was her very best. And for the other one, her very best was an A. To whom much is given, much is required. She could get an A, so that's what we encourage her to get. The other one, a D was Give her a star, okay? <laughs> Doing great, Esther. Now, when she was 13 years old, we went to a revival service where God healed her thinking. She said, it's like something that had never been connected in my mind got connected, in, and she could think better, and she became an A student. Graduated with uh, great from college, and is a very uh, skilled lady in English as well as other areas. Great, but there are times that people's lives become damaged, even when they're a young child. They're abused. They, you know, the, the, the father walks out on the family, and, and there are hurts and, and damaged lives. 
And God knows people that are damaged and that it could take longer for them to heal. And we as pastors and leaders need to be patient with those people. That they have damaged lives. That, that, that God has a different timetable. They can't run as fast as the person that had a good family and a good upbringing. No, they've got weights, they've got burdens, they're damaged souls. And so God is very patient with some people. But not everyone. Was God patient with Jonah? When God said, go to Nineveh and preach what I said? And Jonah said, no way, Jose! No! I'm going the other way. I'm heading off to Tarshish, to Spain. Opposite of Nineveh. Now, if he had been a baby Christian, God may have dealt lightly with him. He wasn't a baby Christian. He was a prophet of God. He knew better. And what happened to him? <laughs> the storm, thrown overboard, swallowed by the big fish, Three days, it's getting stuffier and stuffier in that, you know, belly of the fish. And, you know, not, not much oxygen left in here, you know. And yet, God didn't do that to destroy him. God did it to bring him to full, deep repentance. But God had a higher standard for him than for a young baby. So, we don't condemn people that are uh, babies and that are struggling to overcome weaknesses, but we want to make sure they are going on in God, that they don't stay the same. A person in third grade shouldn't still only know th third grade math when they're in fifth grade and seventh grade and tenth grade. No, they need to go on. And we need to go on in a maturing perfection. So that God looks at us at every step of the way and says, that is my son, that is my daughter. I am well pleased. I am proud of my kids. That's what God wants to say of you and of me. He wants to look down with joy. We're not perfect in a full, mature, complete, having fulfilled all our life yet. No, we're not there. But one thing we do, leave behind the failures of the past, the things that could weigh us down. Run, press on, not walk on, not da, da, da. no, press on. Oh, it's a race. It's, it's difficult. Put yourself into it. Go forward. Reach out to the upward call of God that we have to go higher. We have to go on in God. We have to carry our cross. We need the breakthroughs. And God, by His grace, will see us to the finish line with great triumph and glory. And if there's anything else in us, contrary to that, that isn't that maturity, God will pop that up. God will shine a brighter light on any area of our life that may still have darkness, and He'll cleanse that away. And as we're running on into the brighter light of God, we might see another uh, imperfection in our life, another dark area. Oh, Oh, I didn't know that was in my heart. Oh, Lord, cleanse me. Deal with that. And there's more and more light filling our life. More and more holiness and victory. Okay? Let's go on to slide 32. Okay? But with a circumcised heart, God will bring us into fully loving the Lord and learning to live a fully righteous life. The Lord will circumcise your heart and the heart of your children to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. With a circumcised heart, we will gain victory over sin, putting off the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. With a circumcised heart, we will seek God's praise, not man's praise. Because Paul said circumcision of the heart will bring us not praise from men, but bring us into the praise of God. We're searching for God's praise, not man's praise. I know how easy it is for musicians and singers that were brought up in the world or, or that see worldly things, which are even all over the church, that everybody's taught, you know, well, you just sing this certain way, you know, and smile, and laugh. 
and you know, oh, you'll entertain, everybody will be happy, da -da -da -da, okay? And, uh, and you just play a certain way and make everybody happy with your music, and, and you're getting admired by the people to say, great job, you're the best guitarist in Antipolo, hallelujah, okay? But sometimes we're seeking man's praise. And we're looking at the other musicians. How are we doing? How oh, you did great. How oh, oh, this is right on. You know, and we're not worshiping God. We're idolizing our talent. We're congratulating each other if you're a music group. And sometimes our hearts are not fully set on worshiping God. If we're circumcised of heart, oh, our hearts will be focused on the Lord. We won't be Christian entertainers putting on the big show at church, we will be the worship team bringing people into God's presence, bringing them into loving the Lord more and more, feeling the wonderful presence of God get thicker and thicker as we ascend higher and higher into God's presence with a circumcised heart that is our portion. And with the circumcised heart, we gain victory over sin. The circumcision of Christ helps us put off the sins of the flesh. Okay? We will practice what we preach when our hearts are circumcised. Jesus warned us in Matthew 5, 19, and encouraged us. He said, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom. But whoever does all the laws and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. How many of you teach other people sometimes? Even if you just teach your younger brothers and sisters or your neighbors, you're teaching other people sometimes the word of God. We can be either the least in heaven if we teach and don't practice what we teach. Or we can be the greatest if we teach everything that's right and we live it. We don't want to qualify for that scripture in Exodus 4, and the Lord sought to kill him. <laughs> right? We don't want to be in the belly of a, way, of a big fish and say, oh, did I do something wrong? You know, maybe I did, Lord. You know, maybe I didn't obey you, and maybe, maybe I'm learning. We don't want to wait until things are falling apart. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as the Israelites did in the wilderness where they turned away from the tests of God, and they had to wander for another 38 years, and that generation never entered into the full plot promises and blessings of God. God wants to circumcise our hearts we will respond to his word. When he says, come up higher, we'll say, Lord, by your grace. I don't know how, but by your grace, I'm going to press on. Lord, with your help, we're going to go higher. Lord, I'm going to get victory over this, this sin that has hung on me for so many years. Lord, I'm, we're going on by grace. That's what God wants to give us. Slide 36. How can we gain a circumcised heart? First, by carrying our cross daily, dying to sin daily, so that step by step, from strength to strength, glory to glory, victory to victory, we progressively enter in to becoming crucified with Christ. That the life of Christ, the heart of Christ, brighter and brighter shines out of our life. As the scripture in Proverbs 4 tells us, the path of the just is like a shining light that shines brighter and brighter until the full noon day. That's what God wants for your life, for those you disciple. will shine brighter and brighter, walking in the light of God, carrying our cross and putting aside the things He shows us. And how does He show us? We need to let the sword of the Spirit, the anointed Word of God, cut and expose sin in our hearts. As many as leave behind the past, press on, they're perfect. And if there's anything else in you that is not perfect, God will reveal that to you. How? The sword of the Spirit will cut 
some area of our heart. Expose us and expose what are the thoughts and intents of our heart. That there's something wrong. There's something that God is not pleased with. Now, the sword of the Spirit is to cut open our heart. And we find with the Old Testament priests, slide 38, that they had to cut up the animal sacrifices and cut up the different areas before they laid them on the altar to, for the flesh to be burned up. And there are times that the sword of the Spirit has to cut our flesh, has to expose. The old priests, they had to cut between the joints uh, to separate the legs and cut off the head. But the sword of the Spirit cuts between joints and marrow, separates soul and spirit, exposes the inner recesses of our heart to show us what we need to put on the altar and ask God to burn away in the fire of His love and His holiness. And so, Leviticus chapter 1 tells us how the sacrifice needed to be cut up. There was the head that had to be cut off and put and burned on the altar. And the head speaks of the Word of God exposing when we have wrong thoughts. So we'll cry out to God, Lord, I keep thinking these wrong things, Lord. I, 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 these pictures flash in my mind. Oh, Lord, take them away, Lord. Lord, I'll burn them out. And if we cry out to God, He can deal with the sin in our minds. And we can gain. They burned up the head, burned up that flesh. God can burn the fleshly sins out of our thoughts and minds. Then there was the legs. There was the walk that, again, was cut off and put on the altar to be burned in fire. And the Bible tells us, walk in the Spirit so that you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And we need to learn to walk in the Spirit and only go where God shows us and do what God shows us so that we will not be trapped in fleshly desires. There is the fact that was speaking in the Old Testament of the prosperity of the sacrifice. And there are times God brings us into, uh, into prosperity and people compliment you. Oh, how fat you become, you know, because you're prosperous, you know, you're doing real good in life, you know. Now, I prefer this level of fatness, but each to their own, okay. But it speaks of prosperity. And there are times we become prosperous and, as Pastor Edwin warned us, we can forget God. But we need to put that on the altar. Lord, in my prosperity, it's all from your hand. It came from you. I'm giving it back to you. It's yours, Lord. And then there was the inwards. They had to cut open the bowels and burn the inside. And that speaks of the inner affections and secret desires that's inside of us. And there are times that we have wrong inner affections, wrong loves, that we're getting attracted in wrong ways to wrong people or to wrong goals in life. I can remember once, some years ago, I was organizing in my bedroom. Uh, uh, the, the, we had two shelves of DVDs of movies and nice movies, sound of music, Life of Jesus. And, but there was one group of movies that I really liked. Uh, they didn't have bad sex in them. They didn't have swearing. But they, were, they, they weren't Christian movies. But I really liked the actors. And I'd watch those movies. And I'd think about it for days. Oh, I just so great. And, and so as I was arranging this and had that little section of DVDs there. And I was looking at them and admiring my growing collection. <laughs> The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, So, these are your idols. It was a sword in my heart. Idols? Lord, I know lots of Christians that watch those movies. It's, it's, you know, they're, they're pretty clean. And, uh, idols? It was the Holy Spirit, the sword of the Spirit that spoke. And the more I prayed and evaluated, yes, they were idols. I thought about them wrongly. 
I wouldn't meditate on the Word of God going to sleep. I would think about, oh, glory, you know, the great victory that so-and-so got, you know. And, and it wasn't Christ-like at all. And so I ended up breaking and burning those DVDs and don't own any of that type anymore. Idols in the heart, as we're going on with God, God may raise the bar, may show us a higher level, and it's that He knows we can receive grace to cry out when the Word of God cuts us open, to cry out that God will take, as we put that on the altar, that the fire of God will come down and burn that thing out of our heart, burn it out of our life, purify us from that mixture, from that corruption. So we need to lay our thoughts, our inner affections, our prosperity, our walk. We need to lay these things on the altar and let the fire of God burn away any sinful flesh in us that we become living sacrifices. Okay? And then, number 39, we are to learn to always walk in the light. And if we walk in the light, if we're pressing on to the mark of the high call of God, if there's anything in us that's not yet uh, fully mature. If God doesn't show us yet, we don't have to worry about it. Step by step, God takes us on. Step by step, He is changing our life. If we're walking into the light, the darkness will all be shadows behind us as we press on. And if God gives us more light, then we have to obey that, be cleansed, so that again, we are walking into brighter and brighter light. So the question for us, for me this morning, do we pass the test of circumcision? At the very beginning, when God made promises to Abraham, everyone has to be circumcised. If they're not circumcised, they're cut off from the people of God. And God wants to bring each of us into circumcision. And yes, a baby Christian, much less will be required of. But here, we have a lot of maturing Christians, a lot of leaders, a lot of pastors. Maybe some Moseses at the camp. Maybe some Jonas in the fish's belly. And God wants, as He shows us these things, He wants the Word of God to show us, expose. Are we gaining a greater life of victory and holiness? Are we loving God more and more and hating sin more and more? If you're a musician, a song leader, a singer, are you seeking to more a pure, have your praise and your worship to God that it will be for Him alone? Or are we loving the, the praise and the smiles of the people congratulating us for our talent and how good we do? Are we practicing what we preach? And if we preach something and, and we know we still have a struggle in our heart, we cry out, Lord, I'm not trying to be a hypocrite. Lord, uh, let me be first partaker. Lord, let me have 100% victory. Lord, help me to be a shining example of your redeeming grace that the imputed grace and righteousness of God has worked in me and become imparted so that I can stand tall as an example of what Jesus wants to make the triumphant Christian so that we can say like the Apostle Paul follow me as I follow Christ and press on to the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus that's what God wants to work with in our hearts because at the second coming of Christ, the church is to be a bride. And in Revelation 19, 8, the church is to be clothed with fine linen, which the most accurate translation, most modern translations have unless they simplify it, the fine linen of the bride of Christ, the church, is the righteous acts of the saints. It doesn't say the righteousness of Christ, 
but it's the righteousness of Christ that's been inworked into the bride. Christ is not coming back for a bride that's wearing not a beautiful white wedding gown, but a dirty t-shirt and shorts, and she hasn't brushed her teeth or washed her hair, and she goes down the aisle, you know, with cut, you know, cut through her pants, and oh, it's time for the wedding. And when the bridegroom comes near, <coughs> she didn't even brush her teeth. Okay? No. The Bible says. And his wife has made herself ready. We are preparing for the most glorious event the world has ever seen and will ever see. The marriage of the Lamb is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And he's coming back, not for a baby. He's coming back for a matured bride with the righteousness of Christ shining forth from our lives, that the bride will be as fair as the sun, as beautiful as the moon, and as mighty as an army with banners, that the triumphant church will be ready for that glorious day. And we have the privilege of purifying our life and, by God's grace, being the messengers of God to help purify and prepare many others. So today let's respond to whatever the Lord has been speaking to you. We've covered a lot of material. You can study it again when you want from the notes. But right now let's respond to whatever God has been speaking to you. He wants us to love Him with all our heart. He doesn't want any secret loves. He doesn't want any idols in our heart. He doesn't want that his future bride will be defiled with spotted garments of the flesh. He wants us to wash ourselves, make ourselves clean. He wants us to grow up into the image and the righteousness of Christ so that the church will be prepared for that glorious day when we will shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. Let's sing a song and after that, let's have a time of prayer. But let's sing, Pastor Dong, and let's make this song a prayer. A prayer to the Lord. Lord, do it in my heart. Do it in my life, Lord.